Hello, and welcome to Holy Redeemer. We are happy to celebrate this Mass with those of you who are with us here today, and with all of those from our community who are watching at home. Today, we celebrate the second Sunday of Advent. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. My brothers and sisters, as we gather here to celebrate these sacred mysteries, let us first call to mind our sins. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask the Blessed Mary Ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord have mercy. pray. Almighty and merciful God, may no earthly undertaking hinder those who set out in haste to meet your Son, but may our learning of heavenly wisdom gain us admittance to his company, 
who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, give comfort to my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service is at an end. Her guilt is expiated. Indeed, she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the desert prepare the way of the Lord make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill shall be made low. The rugged land shall be made a plain, the rough country a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord shall be, shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Go up onto a high mountain, Zion, herald of glad tidings. Cry out at the top of your voice, Jerusalem, herald of good news. Fear not to cry out and say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Here comes with power the Lord God who rules by his strong arm. Here is his reward with him, his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he feeds his flock. In his arms, he gathers the lambs carrying them in his bosom, and leading the ooze with care. The word of the Lord.
a reading from the second letter of St. Peter. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some regard delay, but he is patient with you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, and the elements will be dissolved by fire, and the earth and everything done on it will be found out. Since everything is to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be, conducting yourselves in holiness and devotion, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved in flames and the elements melted by fire. But according to his promise, we await new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you await these things, be eager to be found without spot or blemish before him. At peace. The word of the Lord. According to Mark. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John the Baptist appeared in the desert, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. People of the whole Judean countryside and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were going out to him, or being baptized by him on the Jordan River, as they acknowledged their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He fed on locusts and wild honey, and this is what he proclaimed. One mightier than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop and loosen the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. As you are undoubtedly by now well aware, I am a fan of movies. One film that I enjoyed when it was released five years ago, but which has grown on me ever since, is the 2015 picture of The Big Short, based on the Michael Lewis book of the same name. Both the book and the film depict a collection of diverse and eccentric figures that were able to anticipate the collapse of the U.S. housing market in the late 2000s 
and the subsequent global financial crisis that engendered. Why have I come to enjoy this film so much? Is it because it satisfies my morbid sense of humor? Maybe. Or is it because of its depiction of institutional corruption and fraudulency, a topic increasingly near and dear to my heart? Perhaps. But I think it's something else. Each time you listen to a song, look at a painting, read a book, or watch a movie, something new always strikes you. Something you didn't notice before comes into focus. When I recently rewatched The Big Short, my attention shifted really for the first time from its large-scale depiction of the economic crisis to the smaller-scale depiction of the characters themselves, these guys who saw it all coming. And it clicked for me why it is that I like this movie so much. In its own unique way, it really is a powerful depiction of prophecy and the qualities required to be truly prophetic. Now, clearly, the characters showcased in the movie were prophetic in the way that we typically employ that term. They were successfully able to anticipate the future. But being prophetic is about more than just seeing what is about to happen, what is coming around you from the bend. Being prophetic is really more about being the truth teller, being willing to bear the cost of seeing things, and even more importantly, publicly acknowledging things for how they actually are. And in that sense, the major players that pop up the big short are prophetic as well. They're certainly not all alike. One is a former medical doctor turned financial wizard. Another is a brash veteran of Wall Street. Two of the guys are basically just kids operating a fund out of a garage. But all of them have something in common. They all cut through the hype and look at the numbers. They have the capacity to see things for what they really are. And as I suggested earlier, what is even more important is that they have the capacity to acknowledge this reality publicly, even when there are all sorts of pressures on them to keep quiet, when there are countless voices telling them they must be wrong, that they don't get it, or that they might in fact be crazy. And sticking to their position does come at a cost. Bosses breathing down their necks. Business partners and longtime friends threatening to sue them. The risk of their own financial demise. But in the end, they are proven right. In the moment of cataclysm, they are vindicated, spared, even rewarded for swimming against the tide. They swim while others sink because of something that has proven time and time and again to be both the simplest and the most difficult of human things. They simply looked. They looked at reality unflinchingly. They aimed to see things as they were, not as everyone might have preferred them to be, and they didn't lie to themselves and others about it all. There is that famous line of the poet T.S. Eliot, humankind cannot bear very much reality. I find it a hard claim to contest, especially today, as more and more people appear to retreat into their ideological cocoons, into the cozy enveloping embrace of the like-minded, where what is reinforced are the seductive yet dangerous fantasies we increasingly stake our lives on. In a world gone mad, in institutions which have become corrupt and fraudulent, in families that have become dysfunctional, in a person's life that is all out of sorts, the piercing words of truth will be unwelcome. Darkness does not welcome the light that dispels it. And the one who speaks truth, who shines the light, will be the one who stands out, who is treated as the anomaly. Consider in that regard the figure at the heart of this weekend's gospel, John the Baptist, the voice crying out in the wilderness. He perceives the light and the truth that is Christ. He is a figure in a world of darkness and deceit. And notice that he is not a welcome figure. No one is throwing a ticker tape parade for him. He isn't being invited to opine on any discussion panel, to sit on the board of directors of a company, or welcomed into the halls of government. 
Recall as well that the religious figures of his time weren't especially fond of him either. To almost everyone he appeared to be a wild man, crazed and deluded. He was mostly dismissed. Dismissed, though, it turned out, to the detriment of all those who ignored him. For he spoke of the coming of Christ, the one who brings cataclysmic end to all that is opposed to him. The Advent season that we are in is a time when we prepare ourselves for the twofold coming of Christ. Yes, of course, for Christmas, our celebration of Christ coming in time for his incarnation. But we prepare ourselves as well for his coming at the end of time, in judgment and glory. Our second reading speaks to all this in great detail. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, and the elements will be dissolved by fire, and the earth and everything done that will be found out. And what therefore does that mean for us who desire to be prepared for that day? Since everything is to be dissolved in this way, conduct yourselves in holiness and devotion, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved and flames the elements melted by fire. Beloved, since you await these things, be eager to be found without spot or blemish before him at peace. We can't say we haven't been warned. John the Baptist, the culmination of the prophetic tradition, cuts through the comforting falsities of his time to speak the necessary and saving truth. One mightier than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop and loosen the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That is, the one who is coming brings fire. But the Spirit is above all else the fire that both destroys and brings life. Spirit of God consumes all that is opposed to God, all that smacks of death. The Holy Spirit is like the fire that burns away a dead forest, making way for the new growth, for new life. The choice that we are confronted with in Advent, therefore, is really a microcosm, the choice that we are confronted with throughout our lives. Confronted with the piercing voice of prophecy, do we choose to be renewed? which means do we allow truth, light, and life to take hold of us? Or instead, do we prefer to linger in the comfortable bubble of falsity, darkness, and death that is all too readily available for us to retreat into and remain within? And not only do we decide to be renewed, but do we also decide to be a source of renewal for others? Do we embrace our prophetic vocation, one of the products of the baptism we have received by the fire of the same Holy Spirit? Perhaps that is where we are most inclined to balk, to hesitate, to be tempted to retreat into that bubble because we know that saying yes to this vocation has a cost. We know the story of John the Baptist. Prophets usually don't need a happy ending. Let us also recall the words of the very one that John the Baptist gestures towards with his whole being. For those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Which is to say, to live a life predicated on denying the truth of Christ is to be already dead. To be willing to go all the way, even unto death, for the truth of Christ is already to be born unto eternal life. Being prophetic is painful. There is a cost, even if the reward on the far side is infinitely greater than what has been expended. One sees that in the big short. More importantly, one sees this in the figure of John the Baptist. But the alternative is no real option at all. Refusing to embrace saving truth and repeating that truth and word and deed for others only ensures that the necessary renewal which staves off death will never take place. Any person or institution which fails to heed the full implications of truth, of reality, on the present, will end up having no future. Fate here is assured, and it isn't a pretty one. 
Conversely, suffering for the truth, paying the price so that the light of reality might shine forth for others and to illumine our own hearts as well, is never a waste, even if everyone and everything opposes us when we do it. For in the words of another poet, which so eloquently expresses the spirit which must animate the heart of every prophet, I am not afraid they'll trample me. Trampled grass soon becomes a path. Trusting in our God who desires to renew us all, we now offer him all of our needs. For the renewal of the church, that the Lord may sanctify her during this holy season of Advent, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For our nation, that the Lord may guide the minds of those who govern in order to promote the common good and assure justice for all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For our parish community, especially Daniel Montero and Casey Moore Hudson, who will be confirmed this weekend, that the Lord may draw us together in and through the sacramental life of the church. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. For all who are suffering from the coronavirus and other illnesses, that God will heal the sick and give strength to those who care for them, especially Anna and Dora, Simon McNabb, Father Charles Smarsh, Eileen Walters, and all those listed in our book of the ill and infirm. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For those who have died, that they may be granted the peace of God's heavenly kingdom, especially Ronald Seibel, father of Laura Sellers and grandfather of Julie Witzkel and Mary and Emily Solace, and all those listed in the book of our beloved dead and all those listed in the book of remembrance this November. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Good and gracious God, we all give these our needs, those that we have uttered and those which remain the silence of our hearts. Confident that you hear them all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours is acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Be pleased, O Lord, with our humble prayers and offerings. And since we have no merits to plead our cause, come, we pray, to our rescue with the protection of your mercy, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. We assumed at his first coming the lowliness of human flesh, and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago, and opened for us the way to eternal salvation. But when he comes again in glory and majesty, and all is at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which now we dare to hope. And so with angels and dark angels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all your creator rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. You never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, O oh Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Lord, we pray upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so we may obtain an inheritance with your elect especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Wilton, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. 
In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to it, their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we always be free from sin and safe from all distress, as we wait the blessed hope, the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my name, but only say the word of grace.
act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Replenished by the food of spiritual nourishment, we humbly beseech you, O Lord, that through our partaking in this mystery you may teach us to judge wisely the things of earth and hold firm to the things of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Thank you to the members of the Health and Safety Ministry for working so hard to ensure that we can all worship together safely weekend after weekend. We are always looking for more volunteers to help with this important ministry. If you are able to help, please contact Marie in the parish office. This Tuesday, December 8th, is the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Masses will be celebrated at 8.30 a.m. 12.10 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. We are ready to announce our schedule of Christmas Masses. In order to safely accommodate worshipers at the mandated reduced capacity, we have added two additional Christmas Masses to our normal schedule. This year's schedule is the following. Masses at 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7.30 p.m., and midnight on Christmas Eve, and 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Christmas morning. Attendance for Masses at 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve will be by sign-up only. Sign-ups for those Masses will be open on Sunday, December 13th at 12 noon. The Lord be with you. Lord Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the Almighty and merciful God, by whose grace you have placed your faith in the first coming of his only begotten Son, and yearn for his coming again, sanctify you by the radiance of Christ's advent, and enrich you with his blessing. As you run the race of this present life, may he make you firm in faith, joyful in hope, and active in charity. So rejoicing now with devotion at the Redeemer's coming in the flesh, we may be endowed with the rich reward of eternal life when he comes again in majesty. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.